sorry, Bernie was talking about uh, his experience with our in-person meetings. So uh, the bar is set pretty high. And we're going to have to show him what an online meeting really looks like across. This is, this is the bar for the district. Yeah. No so, yeah. So you can get any kind of drink here in the morning. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. No, sorry, that, not that kind of bar. Okay. It is at my house. <laughs> hey. Well, you've been relegated to the basement again, I see, Ian. Absolutely, but but it's a great spot. Nice. I agree. I agree. It's catching on. <laughs> well, speaking of catching on, how about we kick off this here meeting? Welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of St. Albert morning Zoom meeting number 1,500 this morning, April 2nd, Groundhog Day number 374. <laughs> this is uh, amazing. This is Easter. This is Good Friday. This is the day after April Fool's Day where all of the pranks are 50% off. So let's kick this off with standing to sing, O Canada. Nicely done. Thank you for that. And our land acknowledgments, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Matisse peoples. As treaty people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, we share the responsibility for stewardship of this beautiful land. And now we're going to go to our inspirational moment with James, also known as Jimmy the Greek. <laughs> Thank you, President Mark. Good morning, my brothers and sisters, fellow Rotarians and guests. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to give the inspirational moment. Um, I was spending some time on what I wanted to be inspired myself with, and I was having some tough times, and I said it read some of the classic poems, and I did some of this and that, but I did find a video we're going to queue up shortly that I really think exemplifies us as Rotarians, us as human beings, and us is just finding a, a nice way to live in this world. So as we gather as brothers and sisters and friends of Rotary, let us ever be mindful of the needs and feelings of others. Let us ever be grateful for all the blessings in our life on this special day of Good Friday. Let us contemplate our pain, our sorrow, our loved one's pain and sorrow, and the world's pain and sorrow, and know that Easter Sunday comes and the message of Easter Sunday brings love and hope in our lives and in the world. Let us watch that video. A greedy businessman had a heart attack and died. As his life flashed before his eyes, he found himself in a church where he met God. In this church, God showed the man two doors. Inside the first door was a beautiful banquet hall. 
a large table with the most delicious food. The food smelled so good that the man's mouth began to water. He then noticed that the people around the table were thin and sickly, like they had not eaten in weeks. Their hands were set straight with boards so that they couldn't bend their arms to feed themselves. The man began to cry. And God said, now you have seen hell. Behind the second door looked like the exact same room, the same table, the same food, their arms boarded in the same way. But these people were well fed, happy, healthy, and laughing. The man said, God, God, I, I don't understand. God smiled and said, it is simple. Love only requires one skill. These people learned early on to share and feed one another, while the greedy only think of themselves. The man put his head down, realizing that he had led a very greedy life. God gently lifted it back up. My son, your people are capable of such beautiful dreams and horrible nightmares. Your world has enough for every man's need, but not every man's greed. See, life has a rule. It gives to givers and takes from takers. Those full of themselves on the outside are often starving on the inside. See, so many people get heaven and hell wrong. They are not places you go. They are mind states you hold. The fire of hell is the fire inside of you. The heated arguments when your blood boils over. If you let anger and selfishness get the best of you, it will bring out the worst in you. So love kindly. I'm giving you one more chance. You have a banquet in front of you, my son. Choose wisely. Thank you guys so much for watching that video. If you Thank you very much, James. Very inspirational this morning. Introduction of guests, if you wouldn't mind, please. And we have a few guests this morning, I'm excited to say. Mark, I can go first. Uh, yes, so please, we Jordan. have uh, Tess and Bernie here from the uh, shelter box. Welcome, Welcome. Tess. Welcome, Bernie. President Mark, I'd like to introduce my lovely wife, Kelly, who's a fellow Rotarian and president-elect at Northeast Edmonton Rotary Club. Welcome, welcome. Have we covered it? Uh, Lucy Roy is here visiting this morning. So welcome, Lucy. And of course, our very own Natalia. So you know, and Bernie, I promised you this. <laughs> Let's all sing our welcome song. Welcome to Rotary, glad you are here. Come shake our hands and share a friendly cheer. Whether from near or whether from far, we're glad you're here. We hope that you will like our little song because we're proud of St. Albert. And you'll agree, our club enjoys some great camaraderie. So we do what we can to help with the needs of our community. With our friends at Rotary. We 
with the friends at Rosary. Oh, I've got goosebumps and they're in shape of rotary wheels. Daria, if you would not mind introducing our guest speakers, please. Thank you, Mark. So um, Shelterbox is a cutting edge charity and that hand delivers emergency shelter and the tools that families need to rebuild their lives and communities after natural disasters and conflict. The Shelterbox and Shelter Kits contain um, the customizable tools to transform lives and rebuild communities. Shelterbox is formally partnered with Rotary International. So we have uh, two individuals presenting to us today. Um, so Tess is the uh, co-executive director at Shelterbox Canada. She started her journey into the non-for-profit world at Western University, earning a degree in international community development. Tess has been a member of the Shelterbox team since 2014, working to promote the Rotary Project Partnership and fundraising campaigns in Canada. She is currently the foundation chair at the Rotary Club of Toronto Twilight, and in her spare time can be found doing something creative or cheering for the Raptors. Also in 2014, Bernie retired following 22 years as a, a Hinton's town manager to enjoy more time outdoors in the mountains, hiking, skiing, camping, and uh, paddling. He is a 26 uh, year member of the Hinton Rotary Club. Bernie became a volunteer ambassador for Shelterbox Canada in District 5, 5370 because he loves the energy and drive of that volunteer organization and their meaningful contributions to families in great need throughout the world. And ambassadors present information about Shelterbox important work in the world. Today, Bernie will review with us the overall Shelterbox program, which has received ongoing support from our club. And Tess will share how Shelterbox has responded during the pandemic. Uh, there will be opportunity at the end, as usual, for questions. So now, first, Bernie. Thank you. I'm trying to get your screen to run. Is that up there? You got it. Okay. Fair enough. Well, I got involved in Shelterbox because that organization uh, is made up of people with energy and vision, and I really enjoyed what they had say and do as one of the elements that's also partnering with Rotary. I'm very happy that Tess is able to join me this evening, but I'll start with under giving you a context for the shelter box situation in the world and the work that they do so well. First, these two uh, astounding numbers, 19.3 million and 59.5 million are the two numbers. One of the first one is the number of people displaced annually from natural disasters, tornadoes, floods, uh, drought, et cetera. And the other is uh, the number of people displaced due to earth, uh, to human conflict, which I think is a shocking number of people that can't safely live in their own home communities in the world because of conflict. This is the numbers that we're trying to respond to uh, in shelter box around the world. Basically, shelter box is a cutting edge international relief charity that hand delivers emergency shelter to families in need. Uh, they have a vision that no one will go without the opportunity to have a home, even if forced out of their original place due to natural disasters or conflicts. That essentially we don't wanna see any family without a shelter when disaster strikes. Our determination as an international agency is to focus solely on emergency shelter provision. However, uh, I'll explain in a few minutes that there are other elements to the package that uh, is delivered to emergency situations in conjunction with other relief organizations that focus on other aspects of emergency response in situations around the world. Uh, one of the key things is that none of these efforts would be achievable without Rotary. In fact, Rotary was where Shelterbox was first formed back in 2000 in the 
Rotary Club of Helston in England. And uh, it has grown from there to be an organization that since 2012 has had an international partnership between uh, Shelterbox in the world and the Rotary International operation. And that's so valuable in moving things forward because Rotarians are able to not just assist financially and with goodwill, but also in emergency responses, they often have communities, uh, Rotary clubs in the areas that they're being responded to and can guide and work through logistics that wouldn't be as possible for an international aid organization who just arrives on the scene. The, uh, this is an example of uh, the shelter box tent and I'll speak more about it, but obviously we're helping families around the world and that is so important. The uh, iconic shelter box is the green tent and uh, this is what comes in a shelter box. Typically uh, there's some tools, cooking supplies, a system for water purification. In fact, the system now up to date on that is so unique because once it deals with uh, too much water or that it's used for uh, a long period of time, it actually shuts itself down when it can't function properly anymore and the filter needs replacing. There's also blankets and uh, cooking supplies in most tents and of course situations where mosquitoes net, netting and other things are added or school classroom kits, things that are needed for a specific situation. The green box itself can be a water carrier or other carrier after it's emptied and the tent and other supplies are just deployed in, the, in an emergency situation. So a very functional uh, green box that's needed for people that truly need everything, uh, including a shelter and a roof over their head, which really, the way I look at it, is the starting or the continuation of a home environment for a family that's being displaced or uh, has gone through natural disaster. The four types of tents that the shelter box operates are shown in this picture. The top one is the traditional tent that's double layered and able to withstand winds of up to 100 kilometers an hour and obviously follow up storms that might affect people in areas. It's uh, well thought out and uh, I can tell you having put it up a number of times, it's fairly easy to put up but it's also very robust in its ability to withstand future problems so that it can run for a long time and in fact some of these tents have been used for up to five years in situations like in Haiti uh, so they're very important tent. The one below that, uh, second one is called a, a Oasis tent and it's basically designed for warmer climates. It's very well ventilated and has a big front porch area so that you can stay out of the sun. And uh, all these tents can accommodate about five people in a, obviously in a pinch more than that, but this is, uh, these are large tents that are well set up. The third tent is the winterized tent where you can actually put straw and uh, materials into the floor and it's uh, got insulation and it actually is possible to add uh, a heating system and stovepipe to the outside and not burn down the tent. The fourth tent is the unlogoed one and it's used in UN disaster relief situations, uh, mostly refugee situations where people would be targeted uh, as victims of uh, a crisis if there was any substantial identification on the tents. In addition to the tent uh, and the uh, kits that are provided by Shelterbox a few years ago is this Luminade and it's a very unique uh, item. I believe I showed this to you, your club before. They're uh, basically solar lights that can run for up to 20 hours or, and uh, they're very important when you think of disasters because Often uh, there's lots of natural hazards remain around a disaster situation. Your tents and things like that may be in the mud and you still have to find a washroom at night. Women have to feel safe when they're dealing with things or even the kids uh, uh, when it gets dark and they wanna still do some schoolwork. These Illuminades are a really nice addition that's now two of them are provided in every shelter box that's distributed around the world. Here's an example of the shelter kit that exists. And uh, you can see it's more designed for folks who uh, have the misfortune of losing a portion of their home, but the fundamental structure is still up because there's a tarp and uh, tools that are provided. And 
where necessary, Shelterbox gets involved in acquiring metal plating and tin and things like that to help allow a family to rebuild their existing home rather than get a full tent that they can live in for a period of time. So shelter kits are an innovation as well for Shelterbox in order to better supply uh, solutions that are appropriate to some situations. Here's a lady, Eliza, who is uh, epileptic and blind. She's just in her early 20s and she went through uh, a bad situation in Malawi, losing her home through total destruction uh, or, and, or to damage. And she has to look after her younger kids. And obviously being blind, it's pretty important that she knows her environment. And Shelterbox was able to give her a kit and help fix her home so that she could reestablish herself and know her surroundings very quickly and continue to be the caregiver for her younger siblings. Here's another example. This is a, a tornado that hit uh, a, an island known as Dominica in the very eastern part of the Caribbean. And the lady, uh, uh, Blandina Joseph, endured this storm in her uncle's house for eight hours. They put basically plastic covers over top of them as it rained on top of them. And uh, basically the roof of their house as well as their uh, bathroom were blown apart and it was noisy and crazy for eight hours. And then the, sh the lovely people of Shelterbox came and set up a tent for her. So she was able to reestablish her comfort and place of environment, including getting back to her vegetable patch for tomatoes and garden and cabbages, which she needed to continue to survive. So Shelterbox and their partnership with Rotary is such an important part. I've already described the value of that relationship in so many ways. Uh, Rotarians around the world give firsthand knowledge in countries where responses are necessary so that logistical and operational assistance can be done more effectively. Shelterbox wants to acknowledge and continues to acknowledge the participation of Rotarians who financially assist the program at three levels. There's uh, the, the HERO program, bronze, uh, silver and gold levels of annual appreciation. Each club would receive a certificate at their district conference or by presentation from the governor. Uh, a digital banner is available for your website and recognition on the Shelterbox Canada site for your contributions financially. You can take action in a few different ways. And I wanna stress that there's really lots of opportunities to show support beyond uh, what you I know in St. Albert do is cut a check from some of the proceeds of your great fundraisers. People can personally donate uh, one time or monthly on a, the Shelterbox website. They are able to volunteer as well, either as a ambassador like myself or as a club champion, someone who keeps in touch with the Shelterbox news and shares it with the club from time to time. And uh, there's also tents available in this district if you wish to do a specific fundraiser. I know that there have been interact clubs who've set their tents up on the roofs of their schools for a weekend and, and uh, slept up there and uh, ran campaigns to raise funds, things like that. There's lots of ways. Also, what's, what's occurred of late is uh, you can have a Shine for Shelter Box event, which is a, basically a social gathering of four, six uh, friends. Uh, that might not be possible right now, but where you enjoy supper together and then share some shelter box news and, and raise some funds in a, with your colleagues and friends. So thank you for uh, me getting, having an opportunity to explain what shelter box does fundamentally and to thank the St. Albert Club because you are a bronze level contributor annually and we've appreciated that support. I'll now turn it over to Tess. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bernie. Um, and uh, just to echo what Bernie said, thank you for the club's ongoing support and um, for inviting us today to speak to the club. Um, morning clubs are always some of my favorite. I find you get the, the most energetic groups in the morning. So thank you for having us. Um, what I wanted to speak to you about today is, of course, how shelter boxes adapting during this global pandemic. Um, even though it's, of course, been over a year, shelter box continues to adapt to meet the ongoing needs. 
like you, of course, the team here at Shelterbox immediately was incredibly concerned, not only for how logistically we were going to be able to support families, but for the ongoing needs of families already facing natural disasters and especially in conflict zones. We know typically that the families that we work with are already at an increased vulnerability, whether they are you know, facing ongoing disaster crisis or in um, displacement camps due to conflict, and that the potential impact of the pandemic in some of the places that we're already working, like crowded camps and makeshift settlements in Cameroon and Burkina Faso and Ethiopia, really was incredibly worrying from um, sort of day one of, of recognizing this global need. So many of the areas that we work in already have overcrowded settlement camps where it's already incredibly challenging to even physically distance. I think for um, speaking for myself, of course, we're, you know, we're all so much more aware of our home around us and the importance of having a safe shelter to be able to actually physically distance in. And for so many families that we support, um, that's sort of the first option you know, that, that is removed if they don't have a safe shelter or if they do, it's with dozens of other families in a community center or displacement camp. And so at the very beginning of this pandemic, we really focused on how can we increase our ability to provide, uh, especially our tents and shelter options to families so that not only can they physically distance, but they can have an extra level of security and safety during this, this global crisis. And so one of the ways in which we adapted, of course, was um, adapting our aid provisions as well. We, as Bernie um, spoke about, we have so many different aid options that we customize depending on the needs of the family. But the pandemic really um, you know, forced us to think a little bit differently. And we now provide wash basins and soap and masks to families alongside our shelter box equipment so that we know typically families are coming through our distribution centers or accessing our emergency aid. And it's important that we do our part as a global organization um, to meet this new need of fighting the global pandemic. And along that, we also knew that you know, families, again, are, are coming through distribution centers, oftentimes working with our local partners. Um, and so we've also used this opportunity to um, work with local agencies and country to provide education as well, so that families understand the importance of hand washing, um, our water filters have sort of, you know, become extra important during this time, not just so families have clean drinking water, but also have clean water to wash their hands and have proper sanitation and hygiene practices. And so we have really had to adapt and we're, you know, pride ourselves on being an incredibly flexible organization in the best of times. And this has really pushed us to the limit. Um, we're working more and more with partners. Um, you know, as, as Bernie spoke about, we're working all over the world, typically deploying our own staff or volunteers into countries, doing assessments, working with local organizations and oftentimes local Rotarians. Um, but we, of course, aren't able to travel right now. And so that's posed a logistical challenge that we've had to overcome. And really what it's shown us is the importance of our partnership. Again, with Rotarians, we know uh, oftentimes Rotarians are, are people of action in their community, they're connected, they're wanting to do the most to be able to support families in their area. And so having the partnership with Rotary and local Rotary clubs, as well as other local organizations like the Red Cross, uh, Care International and other organizations, we've been able to continue to deploy and support families even when we can't physically be there. Um, there have been some really fantastic photos that have come back from the field of, you know, our training teams in the UK where our head offices have to train via Zoom like we're doing right now with, um, you know, with all of our Rotary clubs and they've had to actually train virtually. So adapting you know, really all of the ways in which we're working. But at Shelterbox, we know, um, you know, again, as I mentioned, really the impact that shelter can have um, during this time. And we know that it's really not going to be over until it's over everywhere. Even though we're, we're thankfully able to start vaccinating here in Canada, many of the countries that we work in won't likely see vaccinations for a number of years. Um, and disasters don't stop and conflicts don't stop during a global pandemic. And for some of the families we've met and spoken to, it's, it's truthfully the least of their worries at this time. But we know that shelter can help spread the, slow the spread of the coronavirus in crowded camps and villages. Shelter can really help families who have lost their homes be able to self-isolate or isolate with their individual families so that kids can get back into you know, education and feel a sense of security. We also know that we can help 
move families out of collective centers and keep them close together. And it ultimately really helps families also reduce sharing. Uh, Bertie mentioned we also provide our um, cooking equipment and we you know, didn't really think at the beginning of this how important that would be because it means families no longer are sharing um, household essentials and families can have an extra level of safety you know, having their own pots and pans to cook with um, you know, and having their own essential aid items uh, really to help, again, be able to physically distance. And so one of the, the case studies I wanted to highlight is really to me that shows the impact of the global community and, and the work that Rotary does all year round to support our incredible work. What it really makes possible is um, earlier last year in April, Cyclone Harold made landfall in Vanuatu as a category five cyclone and it destroyed thousands of homes and really damaged food crops and caused widespread, widespread power outages for many days and weeks. Um, and really, Vanuatu to me is a really powerful example of the, the power of partnership. Um, and even during coronavirus, of course, and this was early on in the pandemic last year, um, we were faced with, a, with that new challenge is how Vanuatu is an incredibly isolated um, country off the coast of of Australia, uh, they weren't allowing any international travel because they were able to really lock down their borders and um, secure themselves against the global spread. And so we had no way of getting our own aid into country on our own. And so we actually partnered with Care Vanuatu in country to be able to deliver shelter kits and tarps, rope and solar lights uh, and kitchen sets to families so that we could continue to work with our partners to support the families who need it. Um, and not be, be slowed down. Um, and really as coronavirus continues to spread globally, the need is so much bigger than we've ever seen. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful for the ongoing support of the St. Albert's Club, because right now, as you can imagine, the charitable sector in Canada and globally is, it's a challenging space and um, your donation is going even further right now. And we're so incredibly grateful. It allows us to continue to reach families we're reach, reaching, uh, getting close to reaching 2 million families at ShelterBox, and it's thanks to the ongoing support of, of yours and other Hero Rotary Clubs here in Canada. And so I just want to say thank you so much. And it's, you know, again, thanks to that support, we're able to continue to adapt. And, and we don't know what the future holds, of course, for, um, for disasters that are coming. Typically um, at ShelterBox, April is an incredibly busy month for us um, with more disasters sort of increased disasters typically in the spring months. Um, but we're also continuing to work in conflict zones, working um, in the Lake Chad Basin for a number of years, continuing to support families in Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Burkina Faso, um, and really being able to prepare for whatever happens next. Um, so again, thank you so much. And, and I know Bernie and I would both be happy to answer any questions from the club. Thank you very much, Tess and Bernie. Uh, questions for Tess and or Bernie? Overwhelmed. So I have, have one, if you don't mind. Please, Ian. There was a comment earlier about have, having a branded tent with the shelter box logo on there, as opposed to a non-branded tent for, for use in UN operations. Um, I'm not quite sure how, how a brand on a tent changes their exposure or I, I'm clearly not seeing something. How does that, how does that change things? Yeah, Bernie, I'm happy to take this one. Yeah, um, yeah so that's a really fantastic question. Um, and it wasn't always the case, actually. Um, for a number of years, kind of early on, um, even you know, 10 years ago or so, um, you could kind of respond with whatever aid you had available. Um, but over following um, the disaster in Haiti in 2010, the international aid community really came together to create the UN cluster system, which is essentially a way for organizations to work together more effectively in disaster. And part of that came from when we're working in conflict zones, um, we all need to be deploying the same aid because what we found actually is that um, if, we're, if you know, we're there in the Red Cross or World Vision and we're all deploying um, similar tents with different brands, 
um, especially if we're westernized organizations, they can be more targeted, um, whether it's for unfortunately for ransom, for identifying our aid workers. Um, so anytime we're working in high intensity conflict areas, we sort of unbrand everything from a safety perspective, both for um, safety for our, our workers in the area and our partners, but also for the families we support. So mostly to kind of not draw any attention. Hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. I also just saw um, a question come in to me about um, confirming the website for donations. Unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulties with our website right now, um, and it'll be down, unfortunately, I think, till about Tuesday. But um, what I can do in the, in the um, chat, I'll go grab it, is uh, we do have a Canada Help page that we're currently taking donations on. Um, so I can share the link, but after Tuesday as well, hopefully our, our website, shelterboxcanada.org, will be up and running. James. Uh, great presentation, uh, guys. Tess, I have a personal question for you. What what made you get into, I don't know if I missed that, or a personal uh, story about uh, how Shelter Box is your life and how is, it, how is it affecting your life? Yeah, I've never gotten that question before. Um, so I studied um, international community development and kind of always knew that I wanted to work um, in the nonprofit sector and specifically supporting international work. Um, and so an opportunity years ago now, almost seven years ago, came up to, to start working at Shelter Box Canada and it was just such a fantastic fit. Um, I've always uh, loved the fact about, so my favorite thing about Shelter Box is that we are really a custom fit for families. We, we don't make any assumptions about what families need. We listen and learn from families and we really put them first. Um, and that was a really important thing for me um, coming out of you know, my education and recognizing that there's so many organizations who exist doing fantastic work and the need is always going to unfortunately continue to grow. But how can we do it in a really responsible way, in a way that um, really kickstarts recovery and makes families sustainable on their own as opposed to you know providing aid and and sort of doing the taking the photos and leaving and our aid really allows families and Bernie mentioned this so well is you know kind of whatever process they're on whether they've lost everything with the tent or need to repair with the shelter kit um, and it's it's the mission that's really kept me kept me along for so many years and working with amazing volunteers like Bernie um, and when we start, when I started um, about seven years ago, we were a staff of two and we've been able to grow um, to a staff of five. And it's just been incredible to see Shelter Box. I was here when we supported a million families and, and we'll be here for two million. And, and yeah, thanks to, to you guys and to volunteers. And that's just kind of kept me, kept me engaged. Excellent, great, thanks for sharing. I've got, one more. Um, if what does it take to like what qualifications do you need to volunteer and actually go in the field to deploy these? Because I know that you have a local team that you go down there and you work with them. But I'm assuming COVID times aside, you would send a team or a small group or one individual who knows how the how the tents work and how the kits work. What does it take to become that volunteer to go overseas, jump into a disaster zone? Like what, what does it take and what's the process to do that? I can start, Tess, you can add if you don't mind. Uh, I thought of sure. doing that when I retired, but I actually recognize now that I'm not the Marine that I thought I was. So you have to be able to sleep under a tent or under a tree and basically not become a liability for the situation. Firstly, but you also have to be very good at not just the physical capabilities of demonstrating and showing how to work the tents and things like that, but understanding the culture and adapting your message and communications, figuring out the logistics of working things in different communities. Those are really important skills. So the way I look at it, it's almost like marine training in a short form uh, that, that they actually put you through in a process. And I think it's legitimate because it is so challenging. I've worked in international development a bit, but I can tell you the cultural understanding and the, the need to be self-sufficient, but yet wise and be able to engage and bring partners together to make things happen in an orderly way. 
pretty challenging from starting, finding a place where you can put 600 tents into a camp to uh, educating people to making sure the, the, the supplies get to you because they've uh, been hauled by Tuk Tuk and on people's backs to get to uh, some of the situations we've had to respond to. So you've got to really be have your wits about you. I once met uh, a group in Zanzibar from uh, Doctors Without Borders and all these doctors were on a two week break, but they actually said the people they admired their most in their operations were the logistics guys because they had the toughest job. And that's, I think, what the truth is in international service and development. Tess, any more? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think you nailed it, Bernie. It's kind of a combination of, of mental toughness and physical ability, of course. Our shelter bus um, aren't a, a lightweight aid solution um, with our tent, um, but also, so there is a heavy sort of heavy training process and I encourage anybody to apply. Um, it's all run through our headquarters and our operations team in the United Kingdom, but um, we do have about eight uh, response team member volunteers here in Canada. Um, sort of spread across the country and um, just under 200 globally. Um, and they go through a pretty rigorous training process from sort of initial interviews of, um, you know, virtually, of course, and then eventually once we're, we're opening it up again after um, COVID is under control, um, you do a sort of seven-day intensive training. Um, in North America, we host one, and then there's a few hosts around the world. Um, and you do a seven day training that you have to get yourself to essentially. And from there, about 10% of people who do that initial training get invited to um, the UK for a, a week long training. Um, and at that point, you're, you're pretty much you know, through. Um, we have had people sort of get to that point and realize this isn't for me. It's, um, it's not because we're, we're putting our volunteers into sometimes challenging situations, we really need to make sure, as Bernie mentioned, kind of that they're the best of the best and that they're, are, we're putting their safety first. Um, but it's an incredible role. I myself have never deployed, but um, my colleague, uh, co-executive director, Steph, has a few times and we've got some great volunteers. So I'd encourage you to look into it if it's something you're interested in um, and, and get in touch, email us if you've got any questions or want to be connected to any of our current volunteers to ask any more questions. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Alan, you have a question? You're on mute, mute my friend. There we go. How much, sorry about that. How much money is raised in Canada for shelter box? Uh, and uh, do you know what your global uh, budget looks like? So obviously that looks a little bit different last year and this year than, than it has in years past. Um, here in Canada, on average, though, we're about a million dollar organization um, with about 40% of that coming from Rotary Club. Um, which is an incredible, uh, incredibly generous amount. Um, I don't have the, the global numbers off the top of my head, um, but because they're in pounds, but I believe it's sort of, uh, at least an 8 million uh, pound organization. It um, definitely could be more. The United States, we've also got 15 affiliates all around the world who globally support the mission. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of all purchasing aid and, and working together to support the work that Shelterbox does. Um, continuously growing, of course, again, aiming to reach 2 million families, but little sidetracked uh, as we all are with the global pandemic, but typically in Canada, about a million dollars. Do you have government matched funds? We don't actually. Um, so we don't receive any government funding here in Canada. Um, we sometimes participate in the global when the government of Canada does matching, but because of how we work, um, we don't take any designated dollars, meaning that um, you can't decide what aid item or where you would like your donation to go because we need to be really as flexible as we can. Um, we sort of operate on a model uh, that aid is pre-funded so that when a disaster strikes, we can respond immediately and we're not waiting for dollars to come in the door. Um, and because of that, we, we aren't often eligible, unfortunately, for um, Canadian matching, but when able, we definitely take advantage of it. Okay, thank you. And uh, Lucy has asked in the chat box, approximate cost of one shelter box and what is most needed? Yeah, so I see 
Bernie's mentioned there too, um, the cost is $1,200 uh, for a shelter box, and it's about 150 for a shelter kit. Um, and then we sort of, again, customize that solution based on what's needed. Um, right now, we find we're deploying mostly shelter kits at the moment, um, along with solar lights and water filters, as I mentioned, especially with their sort of intense need for clean water at the moment. Um, but then it sort of depends. We also preposition aid um, in global hubs around the world so that we can draw on prepositioned aid quickly. Um, but the need, so the need is sort of always changing. Um, but typically, right now, we've been finding we're deploying a lot of shelter kits. Thank you. A final question for Tess and or Bernie. Seeing none, I'm going to go here. And um, this certificate is for Bernie, but Tess, I'm going to get one of these for you as well. And as a thank you for your presentation at our meeting today, in recognition of your contribution, the St. Albert Rotary Club will be making a donation in your name to the Rotary International Polio Plus program, a worldwide prog program focused on polio eradication. Yeah. But that's not all, because Mr. David Dooley has a presentation to make. I do. Thanks, President Mark. Tess, Bernie, what a great uh, presentation. Thanks so much for that. It really helped our club understand a little bit more about what Shelterbox does. I was talking to my kids last night before bed and I told them I was going to be doing this today and they said, Shelterbox, tell me a little bit about Shelterbox. So I told them, and for those that don't know, my place is like the military camp that Bernie sort of spoke of there. Like the only thing I'm missing right now is the whistle from the sound of music where you blow the whistle and the kids all line up. That's the next thing I'm up for. I'm up for a whistle. Anyway, I was telling them about it because obviously my family, we love camping. We love tents. Bernie, I think we're a really strong contender. Ian, if you want some um, practice, come over here. I think we could pitch some tents and see what it's like because... Obviously, my kids love camping so much, and I'm pretty confident I can get more than five of my kids in one tent. I'm sure that also happens out in the field in a pinch, but I'm pretty confident we can get a lot of those kids in there. And they asked me what else went in there, and I said about the water, because, of course, water's close to me. I, uh, I really like the idea of water filtration and, and clean water for life. And then I mentioned about uh, educational supplies, and they said, is that like the UCP's draft curriculum and I said well no no it's, it's different like this one you don't use as toilet paper this one is just straight educational supplies so we got chatting to all of those sort of all those sort of things and I said how you know we were going to make a, a virtual check presentation today and they said well how did you come up with the number and why did you come up with it well the answer is that our international um, committee here at our great Rotary Club what they decided to do was we decided to present to shelter box. We decided to do that because typically in the past, the, um, the exchange students have always been one of our major fundraisers for our shelter box within our club. Whilst my international has donated certain amounts in the past, nothing like the, the exchange students uh, typically donate. So this year and last year, of course, no exchange student. I, we felt that shelter box was perhaps missing out on that side. Then there was discussion about, should we just buy the tents and get our club to help fill the tents or, or should we just do the kit? So what we've decided to do was I, I reached out to Tess a month or two back and I said, Tess, look, what's the real need right now for shelter box? And the answer was very clear. The, the answer is everything is required. And instead of just buying just tents and rigging it out, let's just get the, the check over to you guys and let's see what you guys can do. In the past, I've also done here in my club the Stop Hunger Now. Wouldn't that be a great thing? I mean, I've been to Vanuatu, I've been to Fiji, I've been to New Caledonia, I've been to all those countries that are typically affected by those cyclones. And wouldn't it be great to have, like, our last big meal packaging event went to Haiti? Wouldn't it have been great to, to mirror or to see some shelter boxes down there at the same time as our Stop Hunger Now? Kim Bagara, I mean, she came back from Malawi a few years ago and was very proud in our photos that she showed to show a shelter box. She said, I finally got to see a shelter box in real life in Malawi. So, I mean, there's some really uh, good club involvement there that we've done. Anyway, enough preamble. Um, Tess and Bernie, uh, on behalf of our club, 
I would like to present you with a check for Mark five thousand dollars from um, from our, our club. Uh, I'm sure you can put that to uh, a good use. Uh, we think you're a fabulous uh, disaster relief organisation, and we're proud to support you guys. Thank you so much. Absolutely, you. there's such a need, and this will make a, an incredible difference right now. Thank you very much. Thanks, President Mark. Thanks, Thank David. You. Nicely done. Thank you again, Tess and Bernie. A few reports and announcements. We have our board meeting coming up on April 6th. So if you have anything you'd like discussed at that meeting, please forward it to me or another board member or join us. It's a, it's a fun time. Uh, the Interact Club celebration is the charter celebration is happening the evening of April 8th at six o'clock. You will have seen invitations to that. Please come out. We are so excited about uh, chartering this new uh, community interact club. The district uh, leadership assembly is happening on the 17th. And um, I believe um, Craig and the incoming board members um, are signed up for that. Um, everybody is welcome to attend. Uh, there's some amazing speakers, including the uh, Rotary International President. Our club assembly is happening on April 22nd. Are there any other announcements? Ian. Good morning, all. Um, one, of the, one of the main events that we are involved with in the city of St. Albert is the St. Albert Music Festival. And I would just like to let the club know and everyone else that they are talking to you and um, the whole world really that the event begins on April 6th and will run through to April 16th. And it's, I believe, and I don't know that I should make this claim, but I believe we are the largest in the province in 2021. Uh, so big kudos to everyone involved in that because there, there are a lot of events that simply are not able to run for this year. So I'm very proud that we are a major driving force of this event and it begins Tuesday. So away we go. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. It's music to my ears. Nice. Andre. And I just want to remind everybody about the uh, uh, safe car rally happening on June 5th. I want you guys to get signed up. And if you're uh, happen to want to be a business or a stop, uh, please uh, help support us. Uh, that the need for safe has grown immensely this year in terms of what we are able to do. And, and uh, your support would be greatly appreciated. 50 bucks a car uh, to register to go to stopabuse.ca. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Amazing amazing cause and uh, looks like a, a very fun event. Any other announcements? Yeah, uh, just one, uh, <clears throat> Marcus, Ed, Ed here, excuse me. Ed? <clears throat> um, I'm just speaking on behalf of Jason, uh, who's not on this call because he's up in Fort Mac today. Uh, I just want to give a heads up to the club that uh, uh, through Jason's hard, mainly uh, hard work, uh, we are going to be rolling out um, the program of the uh, rotary signage uh, for people's front yards and some stickers kind of thing in order to advertise uh, uh, that you're a rotary member to your uh, community, your, your neighborhood kind of thing. Um, I've got all the details worked out. I'm still working with Laszlo as to how he wants to proceed on uh, the collection. Uh, just so you know, ballpark cost uh, for the front yard sign and uh, you know sticker package uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at about 20 bucks is what we're thinking. So just a heads up. And as soon as uh, we have all the details, all the blanks filled in, uh, we'll be rolling that program out. And uh, yeah, we'll be coming by with a sign for your front yard. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Ed. I am very much looking forward to that program. Increase our profile even more in the communities. Any other announcements? Mark, I have a question. Jerry. Um, Lazo, maybe you can answer this um, uh, regarding the flag program. Where do we sit right now with numbers and um, will we be uh, painting more flagpoles and putting them together? Uh, I guess uh, next month is the first weekend. Yeah, so um, 
Talk to Robert. We're going to do a build or a building and a painting bee once some supplies arrive. We're sitting at about 350. Uh, I think we're going to do a mass advertisement here with John's help uh, shortly. So just stay tuned. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Jerry. Thanks for the answers, Laszlo. Anyone else? Going? So, sorry, Mark, I do have one yeah. small thing. Um, sure. Last week, we had asked everyone to throw in some donations to help get the Interact Club going. And uh, Rebecca, I'm sure, apologizes for not being here. She tried to log in this morning. Uh, I was a bit late getting in. She got bored waiting for me, and I think she fell back to sleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> she, texting her. she texted me for the link, and then um, when I got back to her, she hasn't seen the messages. So I, I, I <laughs> she's on for the best of us. <laughs> yeah, um, but I just wanted to say thank you. We had uh, twenty Rotarians um, make donations um, very generously, and. And I just want to give kudos to the club. We have $1,860 at this point to yeah. give to the Interact Club to get them going. So thank you, everybody. And uh, particularly one individual who, who donated more than half of that. I won't say any names because this person probably doesn't want me to, but um, it, was, it was pretty awesome. So yes, thank you to everybody. And still open for donations, right, John? Absolutely, yeah. And, I, and the other thing, I'm going to actually single out one person who made a donation, um, Anita Ruchinsky. She e-transferred me the money directly uh, <laughs> of her own volition. She did not need any tech support. She did not need me to show her how. I am Yay. so proud of Anita. I just, For I'm sure. Like, I'm like, awesome, wow. Anita. Yeah, like a is Anita parent. on the call? Is yeah. Anita yeah. there? Yeah. Anita, right. turn Honestly, up your Anita, I, It was my proudest moment of the week. <laughs> sure. it made it not selling out. Yeah. So the rest of you um, who who say that they can't eat transfer, you can call Anita now for help on how to do that. Very nice. Thank you for that, John. Uh, great news. Such a generous club such an amazing opportunity for this community. Any other Mark, announcements? Yes, Anita. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask uh, if you had or are starting to plan face-to-face um, -face meeting somehow, either a mix of Zoom and face-to-face -face or how's that coming along? Well, we have a board meeting coming up next week and oh, okay. it's always something that we are kicking around. Unfortunately, we're heading into probably another lockdown looking at wave three. So um, not looking positive, um, at least for this year. So it might be a uh, next year's board conversation, unfortunately. Okay. But um, it's definitely everybody wants to get back together and um, uh, get over this pandemic, but we don't want to push things too quickly, right? Maybe then we could figure out a solution to uh, the major depressions that people are going to have and how to get how to get over those as well. That's going to yes. be a rodeo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or another virtual wine tasting. <laughs> Something. <laughs> Thank you for okay. that, Anita. Thanks. Uh, our next meeting is April 9th and Crimson Sumners, the superintendent of schools for St. Albert Public, will be at our club providing an update. Excited. Uh, birthdays and anniversaries with Natalia. So we have this Sunday, we have April 4th, we have Laura Cheryl's birthday. And April 6th, we have Karen Scobble. Mm -hmm. And the date of joining the Rotary, we have Jill Bowman, for 10 years and Lynn King, 10 years as well. Congratulations. Congratulations to all. Nicely done, Natalia. And John, if you wouldn't mind, I, I, I might as well just take Mark's name off of this slide, eh? Or <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to say I'm actually going to ask for donations this morning so we can put some ads up on milk cartons to see if we can find this guy who's been gone for so long. 
Um, no, I, I know he's been really, really busy at work. Um, and he was also doing some stuff with the kids the last couple of weeks. So I, I don't begrudge him that. Uh, but I don't know how to run his game of scavenger hunt. Um, so I guess it has to wait yet another week. So apologies to all of you who were eagerly anticipating a, you know, duel to the death. Um, yeah. Uh, let's bid on an ugly painting from Laszlo. Um, Laz, do you have a self-portrait that we can use? Oh. <laughs> you really don't want to see me this morning. <laughs> there we go. Maybe we can bid on not seeing Laszlo. Um, no, I, I, I think with... Um, and send it to Mark's place from David Dooley. Yeah, so um, I, I think this morning I'd really love to just focus on some happy bucks. Um, as Anita pointed out, there's a lot of stressed out people and a lot of negativity in the world. And I think we could just all use a nice charge of, of happiness and positivity. So let's hear them. What, what do we have happy bucks for this morning? Craig, start her up, dude. So happy bucks. Um, some of you may have heard the Canadian Forces got a pay raise. Uh, so I've been retired a year and a half, but um, the, the pay raise was backdated three years. So daddy got paid. So that's good news. And then we got new floors yesterday. So daddy spent all his money on new floors from mom. So the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. So all good. <laughs> and you are so blessed. <laughs> And I just think it's wonderful to see the the people who who work in the Canadian forces and and take on that very difficult job getting more pay. I think it's I think it's wonderful. Um, no, that's a good one, Craig. Looking forward to seeing those floors too. Who else do we have? Jerry. I have about uh, actually three of them, I guess. Um, I get my Pfizer shot this morning at eleven twenty. Yeah. One. And uh, I'm getting a new front door, and I'm getting a new roof. So there's 15 bucks. For you. <laughs> Fantastic. Sponsored yeah, by Shelterbox. What's that? Sponsored by Shelterbox. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's going to be in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm uh, I'm I'm happy for you, Jerry. Congrats on the shot. That's great. Thanks. Um, who else do we have? Andre, I see your hand up there. Yeah, mine's just kind of creepy, Bucks. Just to listen to Craig talk about daddy and mommy without any kids on the call was kind of creeping me out a little bit. <laughs> well, their son, their son lives with them. So, That's awesome. You know, but yeah, th thanks, for, thanks for that visual, Andre. Um, that's what we all needed this early in the morning. So th thank you for that. Shouldn't you be getting ready for your tour of Legal? It's coming. It's coming. Who else do we have? <laughs> Laura. So first, I'd like to apologize on behalf of my father. Um, <laughs> second, uh, it, as Natalia said, it's my birthday this week, and it's my second COVID birthday, <sighs> and I was being bummed about that, and then I was also bummed about the fact that my age will round up to 25 instead of rounding down to 20 now, which is causing me to have a quarter-life crisis, but it's fine. Um, but I'm mainly just looking forward to spending the day outside with some friends social distancing and uh yeah enjoying my day happy bucks for that Fantastic. hey laura hey jerry laura, um what's happening with the sweet snacks can you update us on that oh sure uh so yeah thanks to uh, majority you guys uh so thank you all so much for supporting um we sold 96 bundles we thought we would sell maybe 30 so y'all really made me work um, so thanks for that. Uh, we, our net sales on Eventbrite was just over a thousand dollars, uh, which includes donations as well. Obviously we have some costs for materials that have to come out of that, but if my brain math is right, I have to do real math later. Uh, then we should be taking, we should be able to make 500 of that and donate it to safe. And then we would like to match that, uh, with money that we have in the district that you guys also donated. Uh, to go to safe. So in theory, we'll be giving $1,000 to safe, but I do have to crunch those numbers to be certain. So thank you guys so much for supporting. Uh, those are going to be delivered uh, sometime tomorrow. I just told everyone to do it during the day and not during uh, dinner time. 
because I know that this is Easter weekend and we don't know when people are celebrating. So do expect deliveries to go out sometime tomorrow. And thank you all so much. Awesome. I think that's a fun fundraiser. Good job, Laura. Who else is happy today? Going once. John, I'll, I'll throw in uh, five bucks for the missing Mark Moran. Because one of the other things that he's been incredibly busy with is he is the operations chair with the music festival this year. And it's not been simple. Uh, like Lori, our, uh, our uh, coordinator, she, um, she says it's way, way more difficult to do this on a virtual basis than an in-person basis. And Mark's been writing herd on a tremendous amount of stuff. I don't know what everybody's been doing, but I know Mark's been crazy busy with this as well. And he's, he's done an amazing job of tying all the pieces together. So Mark Moran, uh, I'll throw in five bucks for him, even though he's missing. Maybe he's just sleeping. I don't know. But uh, he's done a great job. <laughs> He probably but needs to sleep. That's yeah. fantastic. And I wish he was here to say to hear you say those nice things about him. I'm sure he would say thank you and appreciate it. Um, but again, he's missing. So um, who else do we have? Going once. Uh, John, I, I, I just posted that we've uh, started to book our summer, summer camping. So that's a happy yeah. time. And awesome. the fact that my three-year-old is now riding a two-wheeler all the way down to the library and back from our place here, that's uh, also a happy time. That is very happy, yeah. Soon you'll just see him go by in a blur. One more to go. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. And going once, going twice. I do have a few screenshots to share, Mark, if we have a moment. Absolutely. Um, first off, I'm going to share this one because sleeping during the meeting um should should account for a couple of bucks there kevin mm -hmm. you guys That's can all see that picture. yeah he looks like he's sleeping there and then even though she she's already donated so well today because she's so happy maybe that's why jerry has this glow about her oh, what's going on there you guys it's a halo it? it's a halo yeah it's some sort of a halo behind jerry and uh, let's see, who, who else did I have here? Um, oh, and of course, my favorite. If you uh, have decided that you don't want to turn your camera on, I've got a list of you guys all here. So Alan, Spanky, Myron, Zach, Laz, Jody, um, and Crystal. I've got you guys all down for a fine. And yes, Jen McCurdy, I can see that that is actually not you paying attention as much as it's a beautiful picture of you. And it looks like you might actually be participating. You're not, so you get a fine as well. Um, and with that, that's all I've got for the screenshots. Um, I would be happy to take any fines from the floor before we call it a day. And we have none. Mark, back to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John. Nicely done, as always. And remember, we are on social media, and we are very active. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. The recording of this meeting and others can be found on our YouTube page. And we are getting more and more active on Slack. So don't be a slacker. Be a slacker. <laughs> So thank you again to Tess and to Bernie, our presenters this morning, to James for his inspirational moments, John Sergeant at Arms, Natalia for birthdays and anniversaries, our guests, our guest Rotarian, fellow Rotarians. And remember, if you need support, please, please, please reach out for yourself or someone else, reach out to someone else. William King is our caring coordinator. There are many, many online resources, but reach out and say, how can I help? Please join me in the four-way test of the things we think, we think say, say and do. do. Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it, is it the fair concerned? Will it build a better friendship? Will it be a beneficial concern? Will it be fun? Will it be fun? Thank you, everyone. Have a good Friday. Happy Easter. 
Happy weekends. Good to see you. Bye for now. See you later. Happy you later. Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy, Happy Easter, everyone. Yeah. May the bunny be good to y'all. <laughs> <laughs>